the ring? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see it. I got it. A shame never forgets. What'd you do with a Cracker Jack? Well, I've been looking forward to returning to the world of Michael Shane, Private Investigator. And I'm going to take a look today at the film Dress to Kill from 1941. This was the third of seven films of the Michael Shane series starring Lloyd Nolan. And so far, this series has been great. I've really enjoyed these. Lloyd Nolan is just perfect as the wisecracking, goofy detective out to solve the mystery. The film also features Mary Beth Hughes, Sheila Ryan, and William Demarest. I'll give a summary of the film and then give some closing thoughts. Well, the film opens up with Michael Shane, played by Lloyd Nolan, and he's trying on a new suit. As they say in the film, the suit's got to look right because he's buying it to please a dame. And actually, we find out he's getting married. And everywhere he goes, he's getting advice, but not necessarily good advice, about getting married. Oh, Mike, yeah? Have you thought it over? Oh, sure, I thought it over. Why? I'm a married man. I talk from experience. I'd rather put two bucks on a horse than on a marriage license. You get a better run for your dough. Well, well thanks for the advice. So he goes to visit with his fiancée, Joanne Lamar. She's a singer, played here by the lovely actress, Mary Beth Hughes. Curiously enough, she was also in the film Sleeper's West, another Michael Shane movie as a completely different character. But here, she plays his fiancée, and she seems maybe just a little bit reluctant to get married, you know, complaining about the Cracker Jack ring that he gave her. So they're about to leave when Shane hears a scream nearby and runs to check it out. And in another apartment room, he finds a fancy dinner table that's been set with two dead people sitting there. We find out it's producer Louis Lanthrop, this guy who owns the hotel and the theater in the connecting building, and Desiree Vance, who was one of the actresses that worked with him. Lanthrop is wearing the head from a dog costume, which is a little bit weird. Now, Mike calls it into the press first. You know, it's a hot tip for some money, of course. And then he calls the detectives. And then he starts looking around the room for clues, studying the table and pictures on the wall and so on. The hotel manager, Hal Brennan, arrives, played by actor Charles Arndt, gives him a little more background on what's going on. The costumes, it turns out, are from one of Lanthrop's shows, Sweethearts of Paris, from long ago. In fact, there's a framed program on the wall with the program and photos from this play that give him some ideas of who some of the previous actors had been that were involved with Lanthrop. Shane studies the room. He's kind of skeptical that this was a suicide and thinks that maybe Lanthrop's injury that was from a rifle shot was intentional, that somebody killed him, as the rifle has also been carefully placed back on the wall. The detectives finally arrive, and they're led by legendary actor William Demarest, who plays Inspector Pearson. And Honestly, I thought he was hilarious through this film. In all of his dealings with Shane, the two have a great chemistry together. You know, he does very silly double takes with some of the questions that he asks him. Yeah, I know all about that, honey. Look, don't bother me now, will you? I'm busy. I'll be down in a couple of minutes. Who was it? Who's that screwball dame of mine? She's getting impatient. We're supposed to get hitched this morning. Well, congratulate. Stop using that phone! <laughs> As they continue their investigation, the character of David Earl arrives, played by actor Charles Trowbridge, lets him know that the previous evening, Lanthrop had thrown a party for the cast of Sweethearts of Paris to celebrate its anniversary. When asked how this guy got in, he mentioned that he came in through a secret entrance from the theater, as the building is located right next to the theater. Well, they hear a noise in the kitchen, but find out it's only the character of Otto, played by Erwin Kalser. He's a nice old guy who works there, cleaning the place. But Shane also knows him as the doorman that works at the theater that his fiancée works at. And this auto character reveals how he got into the building from yet another alternate entrance into this apartment. Well, the phone rings, and Shane and Pearson both make a mad scramble to answer it. Well, Shane gets to the phone first and listens, and it's Connie Earl calling, played by actress Sheila Ryan. And she's trying to reach Louis Lanthrop. Now, Shane pretends it's his girlfriend because the detective is standing there and listening. And then he sneaks out to meet with this Connie character outside in her cab. He finds out from her that Julian Davis, another one of the actors, had apparently embezzled money from Lanthrop. 
and he gets the address to this Davis character from her. He heads to his apartment, and there he finds Julian Davis and Philip Lanthrop, who was the producer's estranged wife. Now, Davis is played here by actor Henry Daniel. I caught him recently as the bad guy in The Seahawk with Errol Flynn. Phyllis Lanthrop is played by Mae Beatty. Well, Phyllis admits that she went to Lanthrop before the party to ask him not to prosecute Davis, as Davis had apparently mishandled some of his money on an investment. So at this point, they basically hire Shane to prove Davis's innocence. Well, Shane then goes to visit with his fiance at the show, and she's getting impatient with him, wondering when are they going to get married? And he promises it will be later, but then he gets this idea to recruit a couple of the guys that work at the theater to help him with trying to puzzle together how this murder was pulled off. And hey, check it out. It's Manton Moreland. Very funny actor. He's been in a whole bunch of reviews I've done on this channel. He's there working with Ben Carter. Shane offers them some money if they will help him out with trying to recreate the murder from earlier. You know, kind of sitting in the chair so he can kind of get an idea of how it was pulled off. And of course they think it's creepy to be in the seats where the murder victims were, but Shane is trying to put it all together, how someone could have used magician string to pull off the murder with the rifle. Now it's funny, as Shane is tinkering around with some of these things, Manton Moreland's character of Rusty, he's saying that he thinks that his ghost is there, I can feel it, and the lighting does this weird flickering on his eyes. Now, presumably it's from the candlelight, but <laughs> it still adds a goofy, surreal nature to the scene. Well, anyhow, Shane gets this idea of how the murder might have been done, and then hearing piano music, he goes to visit with character Max Alaron, played by actor Milton Parsons, to ask some questions about the case. Now, this character, Alaron, had worked with Lanthrop and wrote some music for him for his plays. Now, from talking to him, he learns that one of his suspects, Carlo Ralph, who he thought might have been somebody to accomplish the murder, was actually killed in World War I, so it couldn't be him. Now, Shane then goes to Desiree Vance's place, where the inspector is already there doing his investigating. He finds a box, and he wants to check it out and see what's in it, so he does this funny trick with a clock behind it to make it seem like it might be a time bomb, and then shows it to the inspector. Listen. A time bomb! That's what I thought! Throw it out the window! No, no put it in the back! Hey, I'll put it in the Hey, come here, wait! So Shane rushes out of the building with the box and gives it to a newspaper boy to send to his fiance. Pearson comes outside, asks about the bomb, and Shane says that he doused it. So Pearson, who has this, you know, false gratitude thinking his life has been saved, reveals to Shane that their suspect is Julian Davis. Now, Shane rushes to Davis first and alerts him that the police are on the way to get him. Pearson shows up. And Shane clubs him on the head and knocks him out so that he and Davis can escape. And they head back to the theater where Shane hides him in a prop room. So Shane heads back to see Joanne, who has opened the box and not having any idea what it is. And she found a note inside and just ripped it up because it wasn't for her. <laughs> and Shane is able to take it and puzzle it back together again. And he sees that it is from the character Carlo Ralph. And it's dated from 1920 showing that he did actually survive his captivity and made it back to the United States. So Shane is able to rescue Davis, who's about to be arrested, and they head back to Lanthrop's apartment, finding an entrance leading to the room of Emily the maid. But it's here they find her dead. Emily, we find out, she had once been an actress known as Lynn Evans, and next to her is a note saying that she had actually killed Lanthrop and Desiree because she was rejected as an actress. Now, Shane, however, doesn't believe it. And he is ready to make his big move to bring out the real killer. And with only about 15 minutes left of the film, I'm not going to give any spoilers as to how it ends. But I thought this was a very clever ending to the film. Wraps up everything nicely and it's worth watching. So let me wrap this one up. Dressed to Kill came out in 1941. It was produced by 20th Century Fox. And it was based on the novel The Dead Take No Bows. It was a mystery written by Richard Burke. The film was directed by Eugene Ford, who also directed the earlier films of this series, Michael Shane, Private Detective, and Sleepers West, both of which I've already reviewed on this channel. I thought this one was really good. It's a straightforward murder mystery with Michael Shane investigating a number of shady characters and on the way putting together pieces 
of this mystery to figure out what had happened. I thought the acting was great. The pace was good for this, as well as the production values, particularly things like the details put into the murder scene at the dinner table. It's just a great looking film. Lloyd Nolan is, once again, just perfect here as this wisecracking, goofy private investigator. He's what you watch the film for, and he doesn't disappoint at all. And, you know, for all of his silliness of his character, he's still a very shrewd detective that's able to do his job well, to dig up clues and put things together to solve the mystery. And, you know, while I praise Lloyd Nolan's more serious roles from the past, you know, he's been in films like Lady in the Lake or The Street with No Name, which I really enjoyed. I think I mostly enjoy these lighter roles where he's playing like a witty gumshoe. He's in a category to me like, say, actor Edmund O'Brien, where he doesn't really strike me as being typical, glamorous Hollywood actor material, but instead he just has that everyman quality. The more I explore these old films, the more I find I appreciate that in a film. It just, it makes it feel more accessible to me, you know? It's more believable when the hero is just more of an average Joe. In any case, I've got four more films in this series, and I'm really looking forward to checking them all out. I also want to make a note about his interactions with Inspector Pearson, played by actor William Demarest, as I thought they were genuinely really funny. In the earlier film, Michael Shane, Private Detective, the police chief was played by a different actor, Donald McBride. And he was someone that you felt just really hated Shane. <laughs> you know, wanted him arrested. But here with Inspector Pearson, he maybe takes the role a little bit more lightly. You know, although he's frequently annoyed with Shane, he at least seems to tolerate him, maybe even respect him just a little when they work together. You know, Shane would even drop little clues for him, like, you know, hey, go check the rifle, stuff like that, and even pretend to get rid of the bomb in order to save his life. It was a quirky, silly chemistry that they have together. And Donald McBride and his exasperated expressions were just so funny in this film. I thought they really worked great together. And it was fun to see Manton Moreland and Ben Carter together in this film. I was reading that they used to do a vaudeville act together, and I've also seen them in a few other Charlie Chan films, where they basically do this silly routine of finishing each other's sentences. And the way they pull it off, with the timing and the humor and everything, it's just great. I'd really like to see more films with the two of them. It was interesting to see the character of Davis, who was played by Henry Daniel. Here he's just playing an uptight, overly serious theater performer character, but usually he's known for playing a villain, like his role as Lord Wolfingham in The Seahawk with Errol Flynn. <laughs> Wolfingham. I, I just love that name. Now, as I wrap things up, honestly, the only gripe I had with this film, if anything, is that the film had two, in my opinion, very gorgeous actresses, Sheila Ryan and Mary Beth Hughes, and yet both of them seem to barely be in the film at all. Sheila Ryan especially, even though she's featured prominently on some of the movie posters. I guess that's just movie posters for you, but still, I was expecting a little more of her in this film. There were a couple other films called Dress to Kill. There was one in 1946 starring Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes. So I should go and check that one out. And I have not seen the Brian De Palma film from 1980, but I was talking to my wife about it and she assures me it's not my type of movie. So <laughs> I'll take her word on that. Anyhow, that's my review of Dress to Kill from 1941. It was an excellent murder mystery film with Lloyd Nolan again as private detective Michael Shane. He does a great job. He's very funny. I love all of his interactions with the characters in this movie. I thought it was an excellent crime film, and it's definitely one worth checking out.